Um, welcome to this evening's concert. I'm David Crochel. I'm the executive director of Common Tone Arts. Um, we are looking forward to this fabulous concert and visual display this evening. It's going to be fantastic. I was listening to some of the, uh, the sound check, and it's just going to be fabulous. Um, if you don't mind taking care of a little business, either now or later after the show, um, we do run on donations, and we take virtually any form of payment. Um, there's a QR code out there. There's a way to take checks or cash or card, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, we do run on donations, like I said, so we would appreciate your help with that. Um, and I suppose we'll leave it there for uh, Sarah Bassingthwaite to talk about some of our upcoming concerts as well. Hi, I'm Sarah Bassingthwaite. I'm the curator of the Common Tone series that you're here for tonight. And before our incredible group comes, I wanted to tell you about our upcoming concerts. Um, this is the fifth concert of the season. And first, I want to do a quick shout out to our last uh, performers. That was the Tom Baker Quartet. And they just got awarded by Earshot Jazz Album. What, what is it? Recording of the Year. Recording of the Year. So that was pretty cool. And they were just here. So it was really nice. Um, and our next concert is on April 29th, um, the last Monday in April. And that's Kin of the Moon. And for you flute players out there, there's some great flute happening on that one, too. Uh, and then the last concert is going to be a collaboration between the Greek Society and the Sound Ensemble. And uh, it's going to be pretty big. I think there's going to be 24 people up on stage here doing some new Norwegian music. So I think that'll be really fun. Um, yes, uh, we do run on donations. So just any amount, if you can help us out, is great. And I think that's it. I would like to welcome the Sustain Music Project to the stage.
Thank you. That piece was called Tessellations, and it was written by Seattle-based composer Gabriella Smith. Tessellations is a musical exploration of patterns and their properties. Tessellations are created when a geometric shape is repeatedly arranged on a surface with no gaps or overlaps, forming a mosaic-like pattern. While they are rooted in strict mathematical rules, which might make it seem like there's no room for creativity, tessellations have, found, have been found to use extensively in fields like design and art. Tessellations involved arranging regular, semi-regular, or non-geometric shapes or tiles next to each other, like pieces in a checkerboard, to build more complex structures. The term tessellation comes from the Latin word tessellatus, referring to small square stones made of materials like stone, clay, or glass, and the Greek word tessura, meaning four. This, this history highlights that the earliest tile patterns were created using square tiles, which are the simplest shapes for forming patterns. During the Middle Ages through the 19th century, a group of intellectuals began observing tessellations present in nature in order to explain the geometric, geometric structures, which resulted in a lot of studies based in mathematics. Today, we can see how the great artist M.C. Escher and another of um others are using the concept of tessellations in visual art. Throughout this piece, you could have noticed the interlocking of musical elements, much like these seamless patterns in Escher's art. They are additive patterns where musical layers build on each other, creating complexity and richness. So if you see on the screen, here is an example in Measure 71. The flute and the clarinet and the trumpet play the exact same phrase and rhythm, but they're offset by half a beat with changing dynamics, creating ebb and flow. The parts interlocked and are never silent in a continuous conversation. Um, so Gabriella's compos composition invites us to contemplate the interplay of patterns in our lives, whether in art, nature, or music. Like a musical kaleidoscope, Tessellations offers a glimpse into the beauty and complexity that arises when patterns fit together, break apart, and ultimately find harmony once again. So that's our first piece. Today, um, we're really happy to be here. We are the Sustained Music Project, and we are a Pacific Northwest-based chamber music ensemble. As you can see, our concerts are rather untraditional, a little bit, as we blend classical music with a wide array of experiences, ranging from culinary arts to visual to storytelling, um, immersive lighting, other artistic and theatrical elements. While we do sometimes play in traditional concert and recital halls, we also take our music to unexpected places like homeless shelters, retirement communities, parks, and schools. Our mission is to make music and art accessible to audiences everywhere. Tonight, we're performing our show called Algorithms, the intersection of music, math, and technology. In this concert, we'll be embarking on a musical journey that spans centuries, from the 15th century to just last summer. We'll explore how math and technology have played a pivotal role in shaping classical music throughout its rich history. But there's also something unique you may have noticed about tonight's performance. Alongside our live music, We've integrated visual projections into the experience, and this was created with the help of an AI video generator. The fusion of art and technology enhances the connection of the music and the visuals, and it offers you something unique to watch while, you, while we're playing. So sit back, let the music and visuals guide you through a narrative that showcases the profound effect of impact and technology on classical music. Algorithms is not just a concert, it's an immersive journey where tradition meets innovation, and we invite you to enjoy this performance today. The next piece we're going to be playing is called Viri Galilei, which is a composition from 1534 by Palestrina. It was originally written for six voices, typically performed by singers with two female and four male voices. However, today we've transcribed it for our ensemble of six instruments. During Palestrina's time, certain mathematical principles and harmony proportions profoundly influenced his music. Um, it was a practice common in the Renaissance era. Composers like Palestrina were inspired by the ancient Greeks, particularly, particularly Pythagoras, who had groundbreaking ideas about the mathematical ratios that underlie musical intervals. Pythagoras believed that simple integer ratios could produce harmonious and pleasing sounds, a concept later known as just intonation. 
So for an example, these ancient musical mathematicians primarily worked with the first four integers of one, two, three, and four. They found that if you take a string and you vibrate it, um, according to these ratios, it produces pleasing musical intervals. Um, for instance, the ratio of one to two gives us the octave. If you take it three to two, it yields the fifth. And four to three. Oops. You want to do it again? <laughs> okay. There we go. And four to three results in the fourth. So now how does this relate to Palestrina's music? Well, in his time, there was a strong desire to achieve harmony and balance in music, reflecting the broader intellectual and artistic movements of the Renaissance. Composers aimed to create music that not only sounds beautiful, but also adheres to the, these mathematical principles. One of the ways Palestrina achieves this was through voice leading, which is melodic motion, horizontal interview, intervals, as well as the harmony between voices active at the same time, vertical intervals. This involved using perfect intervals like those fourths and fifths and octaves, which sound stable and pleasing to the ear. So at the end of Viri Galilei, I have highlighted every single time a fourth, fifth, or octave is used, either in melodic motion or in harm harmonic motion. There's a lot of them in there. So <laughs> as you listen to this, listen for how these intervals are used in the music. You'll hear them create a sense of harmony, balance, and elegance guiding the composition's flow.
Johann Sebastian Bach, a prolific composer during the Baroque period of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, is celebrated for his magnificent compositions, which encompass intricate fugues and enduring choral masterpieces. Tonight, we delve into The Art of the Fugue, a composition written during the last decade of his life, between the 1740s and his passing in 1750. It's a collection of fugues and canons, all based on a single subject that explores counterpoint and the fugue form. Today, we'll be focusing on Contrapuntus I, the opening section of this remarkable piece, and it's arranged for string trio and clarinet. A fugue is a musical form characterized characterized by its uh, complexity and structure. At its core, a fugue is a composition that begins with a single melodic line known as the subject, which is then imitated and intertwined by multiple voices in a highly organized manner. Um, for example, you can see here, the subject is introduced by the clarinet, and throughout the piece, we hear its transformation. Each voice enters with this subject in turn, creating a web of interlocking melodies that engage in a musical composition or a com a conversation, all while adhering to strict rules of harmony and counterpoint. After the subject is introduced, the voices start to explore other musical paths, occasionally circling back to the subject, and there are 10 presentations of the subject. Bach's exploration of the fugue goes, just, goes, on, goes beyond just musical mu beautiful music. In his time, music and mathematics were closely intertwined. The proportions, symmetry, and mathematical patterns in music were seen as a reflection of divine order. Bach, like a musical mathematician, carefully crafted his compositions. Despite their structured nature, fugues should convey feeling and musical depth. Achieving this balance between adhering to formal requirements and infusing expressiveness is a significant artistic challenge. As we listen to Contrapunctus I, let's not only enjoy the beauty of Bach's music, but also appreciate its precision and technological innovation of his time.
All right, the next piece is written by Beethoven, who is a quite an iconic figure in classical music. I'm sure you've all heard of him before. Um, he's known not only for his, his extraordinary compositions, but also for his transformative impact on the sonata form. Uh, Beethoven's symphonies, his piano sonatas, and string quartets push the boundaries of traditional sonata allegro structure. He used thematic development, dramatic contrasts, and unexpected harmonic shifts to expand the possibilities in this form, and which left quite a mark on the Romantic era. Uh, mathematics and technology played significant roles in Beethoven's compositional process. He was a meticulous and forward-thinking composer who employed mathematical precision in his works. And he, again, he used thematic transformations, intricate rhythms, and complex structures to de demonstrate a profound understanding of mathematical principles. Additionally, um, he composed during a time of technological advancement with improvements in instrument design and manufacturing. Our instruments are a little bit closer to what we play now that would have been played in his time. Um, this allowed him to explore new tonal possibilities and instrument timbres, which further enriched his compositions. His ability to merge mathematical rigor with technological advancements resulted in some of the most groundbreaking and enduring compositions in the history of classical music. Today we'll be playing the Entrada, which is the first movement of Beethoven's serenade for flute, violin, and viola. It's um, in D major, opus 25, and it was written in 1801. Unlike many other compositions, this serenade is specifically designed for one flute, violin, and, or one violin and one viola, which is a very um, unique focus on very high instruments, which leaves the viola to play the bass line, um, something that's not often done too much. Um, this results in a serenade that's very cheerful and very laid back. Um, it has a, it, far, it follows a simple and straightforward ternary, which is ABA form, which can be described like this. The A section is the initial part of the movement. It introduces the main theme and establishes the musical character. Then we move to the B theme after a couple of repeats. There's a contrasting middle section. This offers a little bit of new material. And then we go back to the A section um, which it restates the opening material and it brings a sense of familiarity and unity to the movement. In Beethoven's time, serenades were a popular form of chamber music and it was very lighthearted and it was usually played at social gatherings or outdoor gatherings. So, I hope you enjoy it.
All right, we're going to jump forward to 1927 and explore a little bit of serialism. This is a method of composing music where instead of relying on traditional melodies and harmonies, the composer uses a specific sequence of all 12 musical pitches as the foundation for the piece. Imagine these 12 pitches sort of like a set of building blocks that the composer arranges in different ways to create their musical structure. Anton Webern's Opus 20 is a great example of this. Let's look at the first movement. In this piece, Faber the, takes the 12 pitches that make up the basis of Western music and arranges them in a very organized and structured manner. He starts with a specific arrangement of the 12 pitches, and this is called the tone row. Here is the row that is used in the string trio. We call this the prime. Weber takes this row and subjects it to various transformations, including retrograde, which is playing it backwards, inversion, playing it upside down, and retrograde inversion, reversed, and flipped. And these different versions can be organized within a tone row matrix, which is a structured grid where the initial tone row is displayed in, initial, in the forms, and he can systematically manipulate and explore the row's possibilities. Here is the matrix. This shows the tone row starting on each of the different chromatic notes and all four permutations. So let's take the first phrase of the piece. The tone row is presented here with the tone row played by a combination of the three instruments. Then once the 12 notes have all been played, Webern immediately plays the tone, the tone row in retrograde, which con uh, creates a palindromic structure. So I've kind of traced it in the red. You can see the different numbers, and you can kind of follow along. It's a little bit crazy, but it's what it is. <laughs> um, so here on the next slide, you can see the overall structure of the whole piece. You can see on the left the formal plan, which is basically an ABA structure, kind of like that ternary form we talked about earlier, and then it has a special ending called a coda. On the far right, you can see which tone rows the Webern uses, starting with the prime three, the, orig or the original tone row starting on D sharp, or the third chromatic note, and then retrograde three. You can see the retrograde inversion starts on A is next, which is inversion nine, followed by inversion two, starting on D, and so on till the end. So the result of this is a musical landscape that might sound a little bit unusual and abstract to those not familiar with it. You will not hear any singable tunes or catchy melodies like we have played earlier. Instead, you're going to experience a kind of musical exploration where the composer is more interested in the relationships between the pitches and the intricate patterns they create. Imagine it a little bit like an abstract painting. Instead of trying to depict something recognizable, the artist is focused on colors, shapes, and how they interact. Similarly, in this trio, the composer is fascinated by the way that these 12 musical pitches interact to create a unique and sometimes challenging listening experience. So, in essence, serialism is a way for composers like Weber to break free from traditional musical rules and create something entirely new and intellectually stimulating even if it's not as immediately accessible or familiar like other types of music. So imagine that you are exploring a musical puzzle as you listen to the first movement of Webern's string trio.
All right, now we're going to hop uh, another century. Um, the next piece is called Ecstatic Science, and it was written in 2016 by American composer Missy Mazzoli. I wrote to Missy a few months ago and asked her to tell us about how she used math to write her piece, because in the program notes she just mentions that a lot of science and math is at play, and I wanted to know exactly what she did. So she wrote this. Essentially, my concept was to compose a piece featuring three distinct musical ideas, the ethereal bubbly winds, a solemn chorale, and a lively folk melody. Only two ideas would happen at the same time until we reached the climax of the work, at which point all three ideas would happen for the first time and only time. So this piece is constructed around the golden ratio. Um, this is, it's often represented by the Greek letter phi, and it's a mathematical concept that arises from the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers in which each number is the sum of the two preceding ones, starting with zero and one. So zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, forever on. Um, the golden ratio is the limit of the ratio of two consecutive Fibonacci numbers as you move farther down the sequence. In other words, if you take any two successive Fibonacci numbers, such as 8 and 13, their ratio is approximately 1.618. So in this next slide, you can see a picture of how Fibonacci sequence is often found in nature. Um, you can see that the, the shell, the numbers take up certain amounts of the shell, and that's kind of cool. Um, so here in the next slide, here's a chart that Missy sent me. I think she hand drew it. Um, in this piece, we start to build up to that moment when all three ideas, the bubbly winds, which is the pink, the chorale, the trumpet and strings, represented by the green, and the folk melody, which starts in the violin, others join in, and it's represented by the blue color. They're present at approximately 5 minutes and 15 seconds, which is 61.8% of the way through the work, the golden ratio. Other significant moments occur at other chosen percentages, at around three minutes, which is 38% of the way through the work. We hear the introduction of the folk melody, and around four minutes and 10 seconds, which is 50% of the way through, we have the return of the bubbly wind ideas. So these timings ebb and flow based on the particular performance, which was the idea behind the title, a rigid mathematical structure, science, that is sort of blurred by the ecstatic energy of the players. Missy says, there's a lot of math at play. Chord progressions are drawn out, multiplied, condensed, and layered. Melodies are flipped upside down and fractured into the smallest possible element. The horizontal becomes vertical, and the vertical stretches systematically into a twisting melody. The science behind the notes provides a frame for the persistent bubbling energy, a scaffold for the ecstatic gestures that eventually consume everything else.
Thank you. Finally, the last piece on our program was written by Elliot Cole, who's a New York-based composer. Elliot and I attended Rice University together, and when I was doing the initial research of this, pro this concert and looking for pieces that were written in the past decade and that have a direct correlation with music and math and technology, this piece immediately caught my attention. In 2013, Elliot used a computer, computer coding language to compose the Bloom Suite, and last summer, I asked him to rearrange this piece for our group of six instruments. So he sent me this video showing how he uses the code to create music, and I'd like to share it with you before we play it. Hi, I'm Elliot Cole, and I wrote the Bloom Sextet that you're about to hear. And I thought that you might be interested in seeing a little bit behind the scenes about how I did it. So one way that I like to think about music is in code. With programming, I get to invent my own tools that help me think about and interact with music in new ways. So one tool that I've made is called a Bloom. We're gonna make it tell us about itself when it plays. So I'm writing in a music programming language called Super Collider. Uh, technically, Bloom is a class. It's a type of thing. My Bloom often starts life as a semi-random musical gesture. And that's why I think of it as a kind of a flower. It's this kind of wild, unorganized, but often beautiful, natural thing. Yeah, it's not something that you write, it's something that you find, like you find a flower. Like that's beautiful. Ooh. So this is just random. Um, random notes, random velocities, which is uh, volume, but these are sorted, so they stay in one gesture, it starts loud. And then random time intervals between each note. So my Bloom object knows how to do a lot of things. It knows how to transform itself into new shapes in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can see in the help file here, we've got a ton of methods. Each of these methods changes these lists. So I'll show you a few of them now. Um, we can thicken. Actually, let's save this first. Push onto the stack. Same feel, just thicker. We can thin it. We can fit it into a pitch space or have it choose scale that it already kind of fits in. We can move it around in that pitch space. D stands for diatonic, meaning within a scale. Okay, so now let's apply the pattern that really ties this piece together. And uh, let's do this with the beginning of the bloom that the piece is based on. I need to copy this one in. So um, here we go. We've got a new bloom with these notes all moderately loud and all a fifth of a second long. So the pattern that weaves this piece together is called a braid. I call this a braid because it's kind of like it repeats each note a couple of times and weaves that in with the following notes. It builds in a rhythm of redundancy. So if you know your information theory, you know that you have to balance your entropy information with redundancy to get a solid dependable transmission where on the other end somebody receives it and is confident that uh, they understood the message. And that's really not a bad way to think about music. 
Um, you need to balance information and redundancy if you want music to make sense. That's how music makes sense. So that's what this is doing. Um, just to spell it out, if we braid it in threes, it works like this. We go, um, if you have a pattern that's A, B, C, D, E. Imagine a window, three long, sliding along this list. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's like A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E, and so on. Sounds like this. That's the basic idea for the first movement. The second movement puts all those notes in a circle and leaps around that clock by big leaps, like every hundredth note or every five hundredth note. Um, when it divides evenly into the total number of notes, you get a subset of those notes. So it sounds like uh, random cross sections of that initial pitch series, the initial bloom. So we can do something like that just by scrambling the set. Let's scramble. And now let's just take a random subset here. So we're going to take the first 10 notes. Let's hear this on a loop. Random subsets of the notes, you get the idea. We could do lists different, lengths long. Cool. So that's the idea of the second movement. And the last movement is just like the first, except it braids the material into four strands instead of three. So we start there, B, braid, four, play. That's it. Those are some of the things going on behind the scenes in this piece. Uh, I hope you enjoy listening to it.
Thank you so much to each and every one of you for coming out tonight. I hope you really enjoyed it and hopefully learned something new. Um, if you would like to learn more about our ensemble, please visit our website at sustainmusic.org. You can sign up for our mailing list and learn about our next adventure, music, and who knows what is next. Um, thank you so much to Common Tone Arts for inviting us to play this concert, um, for producing this, and having all of you guys come. Thank you again for being such an incredible audience. Um, if you'd like to talk and learn more about the AI videos or what Sustained Music Project is all about, please come up and talk to me after the show. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you.